And I'm Brandy Bynum Dawson, Director of Advocacy at the North Carolina Rural Center. It is with great pleasure that we welcome you to this, our fifth session of our five-part series, Rural Talk, an Advocacy Speaker Series. Today's one-hour panel discussion will highlight the challenges, opportunities, policy levers, and local innovations surrounding rural water and wastewater infrastructure. Now, before we hand the program over to our moderator for today, I'll take just a few moments for some housekeeping items. Please note that all participants are muted. We do, however, want to give you the opportunity to engage with our expert panelists. You can do so via the Zoom Q&A feature. If you're using the call-in option, you can email your questions to events at ncruralcenter.org. Also, for your information, today's webinar, like the others before it, will be recorded and available on our website in a few days. We'd also, we're, I'm sorry. We're so very thankful for our amazing sponsors who continue to have great faith in the work we do and great faith in rural North Carolina. Thank you to our session sponsor, NC State Extension, and our Rural Talk Series sponsors, Cloudwise and Wells Fargo. We'd also like for you to continue today's conversation on Twitter. So be sure to follow and tag at NC Rural Center and at Rural Counts and use the hashtag Rural Talk 2020. The crux of our discussion today will be guided by the expertise and wisdom of a stellar lineup of speakers in the field, including two of our esteemed state legislators, Representative Chuck McGrady and Senator Don Davis, who are devoted advocates for rural water and wastewater infrastructure across the state. Before we officially get started, let's find out who we have on the line so our speakers can tailor their responses to the audience. We'll give everyone 20 seconds to respond to the poll that should now be showing uh, on your screen if you're using the Zoom application. Which organizational sector do you represent? Corporate, education, government, individual, nonprofit, philanthropy, small business, or other? Take a few minutes and please answer that question if you're using the Zoom application. So of those of you on the call, we have uh, about 40% of our, of our attendees are from the government sector, about 15% from education, 19% from nonprofit, 8% uh, corporate, 4% small business, so a, a diverse audience with us today. No surprise that that government number is that high as, as today's topic is all about water and wastewater infrastructure. So glad to, to know who's on the call with us today. And without further uh, delay, let me hand over the virtual mic to our moderator and good friend, Rose Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you so much, Brandy. It's a pleasure to be with you all today and it's a very important honor to be a part of this important discussion and a, and a major issue in North Carolina. We have a great panel today, as, as Patrick mentioned. Uh, we have Mayor Florestein Brown, who's the mayor of the town of Bethel a longtime commissioner for Bethel, who has served for a long time. Another panelist we have is Kim Colson, the director of the Division of Water Infrastructure, which is in the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. We have Sharon Edmondson, who's the director of fiscal management section for the state and local finance division of the North Carolina Department of State Treasury. And if you don't know, that means if you're a, a town struggling with these issues financially, we're going to know Sharon Edmondson. And as um, Patrick mentioned earlier, we also have Senator Don Davis, who serves Green and Pitt counties on the North Carolina State Senate. He's a longtime public servant, including as the mayor of Snow Hill in North Carolina, and knows firsthand the challenges that that rural community faces. Another legislator that we're honored to have with us is Representative Chuck McGrady, um, who is in his fifth term in the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, from Henderson County, also a longtime public servant. Both of these legislators very much aware of the challenges facing rural communities, particularly when it comes to water and infrastructure, a, a challenge that not everybody knows. 
about because it's underground and hidden. And I think that's why today is so important to understand what this hidden challenge means and what the major difficulty is for North Carolina. Across North Carolina, there are hundreds of small drinking water and wastewater systems that are managed by municipalities, and some are managed by private associations. Like roads and bridges, this is hard infrastructure, pipes in the ground for a delivery system and treatment facilities. The challenge we face today is that our rural communities and their economies are changing and have changed, and in some places significantly so. We feel like agriculture defines rural life, but in North Carolina, manufacturing plants, small and large, have been a major part of our small towns since the early 1950s, and many of those plants relied on purchasing municipal water. But our rural economy is changing. And since 1990, North Carolina has lost 350,000 manufacturing jobs, many of them in our small towns. Since 2000, we've lost over 2,200 manufacturing establishments. And these plants, large and small, would purchase water. And since 2010, slightly half of the counties we consider rural, 80 counties, have lost population. So declining private sector water purchases and declining population, and the people who are left are usually older and on fixed income. So you have fewer people who can pay the water bills necessary to maintain the system, and certainly few people who are able to pay as much as necessary. In some areas, you couldn't charge enough to pay for what's left to pay on the water system. And this is a hard challenge, but we have panelists here today who can rise to the occasion and ask the hard questions and challenge themselves and others to provide the effective solutions that are necessary. Kim Colson, we'll start with you this morning. Tell us, how did all these small towns end up with a public water system? Thanks, Rose. Um, first, let me say, I hope everybody out there is doing well. Um, a lot of our systems first started out as drinking water systems uh, that kind of sprang up as communities became more populated and many of them started out as privately owned corporations that provided water for that community. In fact, uh, Chase Bank in New York originally started out as Manhattan Water Company. Um, and as populations grew based on that water infrastructure, sanitation conditions grew worse because there were no sewer systems. And so you had uh, cities where they had tens of thousands of cesspools and open sewers. So then as a result of that, uh, the need for sanitary sewers grew um, and essentially from the very beginning, those sewers were simply to get the waste out of the city and out of the town and away from everything. And a lot of times it went straight into the river. But as our understanding of the connection of public health and safe drinking water and sanitary conditions increased, we realized we needed treatment at the end of those pipes and drinking water standards and that sort of thing. Well, we didn't have a uh, treatment of sewage standards, a national standard until the 1970s. And in the last 50 years, we've spent a lot of effort to uh, put in those standards at our wastewater treatment facilities. And of course, a lot of that was paid for by grants and subsidized loans. To give you an idea of the scale of federal grants in the early 70s to meet these new treatment standards, North Carolina's share of federal grants in 1976 was the equivalent of over $500 million. And of course, I don't think we're gonna get $500 million next year in federal grants to help us pay for our water infrastructure needs. And our water infrastructure needs are in the billions of dollars. In 2017, we worked with the Environmental Finance Center to uh, estimate our needs over the next 20 years and they estimated the need between 17 and $26 billion. And that's easy to see. Um, in our spring funding round, we received over 800 million in funding requests. So that number feels like it's a, a real number. It really does. Kim, fast forward to today. What's the general status of small municipal water systems today? How many have compliance issues and, and what kind of repairs are they facing? 
Well, a lot of that infrastructure that I mentioned that was put in in the 1800s and through the 20th century is aging out right now. And of course, everything right now is changing so much, but the economics, as you mentioned, of our rural communities has been challenging for many years now. And it's been a longer term issue. Of course, we want our water systems to be operated as enterprise systems, but in our rural areas, very few of them are able to operate as enterprise systems. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, most of it is related to just the customer base and the ability to afford management positions, to provide the needed operation positions in order to finance a large enough project uh, that gets you a good price on that project. So their business model in many of our rural communities is you have fewer customers because of these economic challenges. Nationally, we know water customers are using less and less water every month. Operations cost more, operators are harder to retain. So sometimes that makes it harder to stay in compliance. Uh, our compliance rates for smaller systems is worse than it is with the larger systems. And then those capital projects cost more. So it's a tough business model for our rural systems. And structurally, there's just some things that make it more expensive for the customers in our rural systems as well. We looked at the number of people per mile of pipe, whether it's distribution pipe on the drinking water side or a sewer pipe um, on the wastewater side. And to use uh, Mayor Brown's town as an example, for sewer pipe, Bethel has a little over 60 people um, per mile of pipe. In Raleigh, by way of comparison, Raleigh has over 200 people per mile of pipe. So it's a lot easier for Raleigh to afford that mile of pipe because they have two, three times as many customers. And that is typical across North Carolina that rural systems have much fewer customers per mile of pipe. And it's harder to attract a lot of contractors for these smaller projects in the rural areas. So the cost on that per project basis tends to be higher. So as I said, it's a tough business model uh, for our smaller systems uh, moving forward. So they really face a lot of challenges with their water infrastructure systems. Kim, thank you. Sharon Amundsen, Kim has described the physical and environmental challenges what are the fiscal implications for small towns? Um, thank you, Rose. Um, as you and Kim both have mentioned, declining customer bases, both residential and commercial, are generally just a fact of life for rural systems. Um, it, it makes it very difficult for these systems to be viable. Uh, many of these systems, as Kim mentioned, were built with grant funds and built with the expectation that that funding would be available for years to come to help maintain and repair the system, and then sadly, that's no longer the case. Um, some of these systems are so small that um, you can't increase the rates enough to cover the cost of maintaining and repairing them. So, for example, if you had a system with 100 customers and you needed to do a debt issuance to do some major repairs, um, that would likely push the rate per month per customer up over $200. Um, and, you know, that's just not feasible. Um, the makeup of the customer base, as you mentioned, also affects them financially. Um, small systems have lost um, a lot of their commercial base, and what's left of their residential base often uses just the bare minimum of um, water, which you know, reduces the amount of income that you get from those customers. Um, on the operational side, of course, there's repair costs that need to be covered, and whenever budgets get tight like they are now, uh, often one of the first things that gets cut is maintenance cost. Um, and so deferred maintenance, if it's continually deferred, often results in unexpected and emergency repairs, which can be more costly than the original maintenance would have cost in the first place. Um, in addition, with the loss of, co of commercial customers, many plants were built um, to operate at a much higher capacity than they're functioning now. And that makes their operation much less efficient again, costing the local government more money. Um, sometimes in small towns, we find that well-meaning elected officials have opted to give free service to certain groups, charitable groups, churches, and the like. Um, and again, we understand they mean well, but this is really not a good idea um, because it just puts the burden of 
funding the system on an even smaller group of customers, um, not to mention that it's not allowed under current statute. Um, sometimes in a small environment, we may see a reluctance to enforce collections. Um, and certainly in our current situation, that's understandable and the governor even recognized that with the executive orders. Um, but just as a general rule, um, again, well-meaning uh, town officials, elected officials um, may not enforce collections as firmly as they should. That puts the burden of running and funding the system on the customers that are paying their bills. Um, there are ways to assist customers that truly cannot pay and um, oftentimes we can help local governments explore those options. So what happens if a unit um, of government truly cannot meet its obligations and its utility fund? Uh, one of the most common things we see there is that they go to their general fund for additional money. Um, that may work in the short term and for one-time expenditures, um, that may be a good solution depending on the fiscal health of the general fund. It's not a long-term solution at all. And um, we have seen unit of government, units of government run their general funds um, essentially out of money, trying to keep the water and sewer system afloat. Thank you very much. Mayor Glorstein Brown, how does this look on the ground for the town of Bethel? Help us understand the day-to-day -day challenge of managing a town with such water infrastructure challenges. First, I'd like to say good morning and thank you to Patrick and his staff for having me here, uh, serving along with two great people. Um, it, Rose, it's a great challenge. Um, like I've listened to Kim and I also listened to Sharon, uh, and especially in a rural community in a small town, we have faced challenges uh, with having to, like she said, with people not being able to pay their bills, um, the day-to-day -day operation of our system, uh, because we, in a sense, we're not charging enough to cover, but at the same time with having, um, being in such a small town, you can't keep going up on the price, you know, you can't keep raising your rates because we, are, we just, people are just having a hard time uh, paying their bills. But I will say, you know, we have new management here. We have an awesome manager that has come in and looked at the books and looked at things. And we had to be a little hard on our citizens here. And I, I hate to say, you know, that, that we'll use that word hard, but we have to do what you have to do what you have to do in your community in order to survive and thrive. Um, we have put things in place that, um, um, that is helping us with our collections on our water and with the governor putting in place the order that he has, that has really hurt us because I think a lot of citizens are misunderstanding that, that it doesn't mean you do not pay your bill. You know, some, they just totally stop. It means continue to pay your bills, but we just will not uh, cut you off or and your your late fees are waived but we had to had to really push that into the community to let them know please continue to pay your bills and we are sitting in a situation right now where um, we uh, have a pumping station uh, one of our pump stations are in a bad position because it, it floods um, we have problems with flooding and like Sharon said and when these things like that happen a small town do not have the funds to uh, take care of repairs that need to be done. I mean, it, the money is just not there. It's very limited. Uh, we were blessed, and I guess I can mention this now, uh, we were blessed with a grant uh, with the help of Kim Colson and his office, and I'm telling you, they really worked hard uh, to help us, And but I want to let uh, municipalities know um, you got to get out there, and if the help is there, we were turned down um, in the past for grant and didn't get it. But uh, the manager and I decided that we had to use another strategy to try to go out to go face to face, sit down with people, find out what is what what we didn't do right in our grant and to try to make sure that we get the dollars that we need. And we are uh, looking to do a, a merger. We're hoping that will happen. I, we, you know, things are moving along pretty well, but in small towns, you're going to have to look to possibly look to merge because the population is not coming and you cannot afford to keep getting loans. We could not, we cannot afford to get loans. We just can't keep doing it because you get these loans, these 30 year loans, you don't have your population to help pay it back. 
you, you, I mean, people just, you just don't have it. So you got to find other avenues and other ways. And I'm just hoping that legislative uh, will see that, that small towns do need more grants than they do loans. And I, I hope I've hit some of what you're asking. You did. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Sharon Edmondson, back to you. Describe for us the assistant the North Carolina State Treasurer's Local Government Commission offers to small towns like Bethel and solutions that are needed that maybe the Local Government Commission cannot provide. All right, um, thank you, Rose. Um, the first thing we do is um, we'll meet with the staff and the elected officials if we need to, just to make sure that they understand fully their financial position. Um, a lot of what we end up doing with small towns is educate. Um, we spend a lot of time educating staff that may or may not have been fully trained for the positions that they hold um, and educating elected officials, particularly the newer elected officials that may not have the background or the experience to fully understand um, the finances of a utility. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies have decided to kick in all of a sudden. Um, so we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure that they understand the background and how to read their financial statements and the benchmarks um, that we use to evaluate their fiscal health. Um, we'll also go over budgetary practices, again, making sure they understand um, that debt service must be budgeted, that's not an option, um, and help them you know, compile and adopt a reasonable budget um, that meets their needs and includes industry best practices in billing and collecting. Um, particularly, particularly if there's been a culture of lax collections, and, and we have seen that, you know, in various local governments across the state. Um, if that has been the culture, we help them to start turn that, uh, to turn that ship um, to begin to uh, enforce collections on a regular and fair basis. <clears throat> Our next step, and sometimes these things are all happening all at the same time, um, we'll discuss with local officials the need to have a current rate study. Um, a lot of times officials will say, well, if we're gonna have rate study, that means we're gonna raise rates. And, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, what we're aiming for there is for the board to have and the staff to have good information. Um, sometimes it's been years since the local government has had a professional rate study done. And there are so many uh, resources available in this state to small governments for this type of work um, that are cost free. And you know, it really does help the board to know what their current rate structure looks like and the kind of revenue that it's producing versus what a professional would recommend and what kind of revenue that rate structure would produce. Um, so oftentimes we do refer local governments to professionals um, that can do that for them. People like the folks in Kim's shop over at DEQ, um, even though they don't actually do rate studies there, but um, they can answer a lot of questions about the process. Uh, the folks over at the Environmental Finance Center are terrific resource for local governments, big and small, uh, with their utilities. Um, and the folks at Rural Water and SIRCAP, both of those groups will do rate studies for most small governments at no charge. <clears throat> but we recommend this so that, that boards can make informed choices. Um, about what they're doing. Again, it, we're not telling them they have to have a rate increase, but <clears throat> what often happens is that a, a board or a staff um, will realize that they're not generating the revenue that they thought they were generating based on their current re uh, rate structure. And sometimes all it takes is to um, massage that structure a little bit, not necessarily raise rates on everybody, um, but again, these professionals in these organizations I've mentioned can help governments set a rate structure that maybe doesn't penalize your smallest users, your, your widows that are on fixed incomes um, and small, small households of senior citizens that, that just use the bare minimum uh, usage every month and puts more of the burden on your larger users. So um, there are multiple ways you can approach that. And again, all of these folks in these organizations can help um, we also often do bring up the possibility of regionalization. Um, we will talk that through with the local government. Um, again, we, we don't have any ability to compel them um, to regionalize, but we can often raise the issue and talk about the advantages and the cost savings that, that can occur as a result of that. Um, 
as far as what we don't have available to us, unfortunately, is a pot of money. <laughs> um, and many times we will come into a unit of government um, and they'll ask us, well, where, you know, where can I get the funding for this? Do you have any funding that you can give us? And, and we are not a funding agency. We don't have any source of uh, revenue or funds to supply local governments um, for their utilities or really anything else for that matter. But, um, you know, we're more than happy to direct them to the folks over in Kim's office um, and the other sources of revenue across the state, but we don't have any, any source of our own, even for an emergency situation like we have seen uh, with a few, a few local governments over the past few years. Thank you very much. Kim Colson, what are the solutions the Department of Environmental Quality sees and advocates to assist as many towns as possible? Um, we've already adjusted our existing funding programs to fund consolidations of non-viable systems as much as we can. And hopefully through that process, it'll help communities like Bethel get to a long-term solution. And that's the key for that funding priority. It's not a grant to get you to the next two or three years. It's the long-term solution. And that certainty in water infrastructure and having that long-term solution there allows for any kind of economic development opportunity that can come along you to take advantage of. And that's so important for our rural systems that when those opportunities are presented for economic development, the infrastructure is in place that allows that to happen. Like Sharon indicated, education is a big part of things as well. And we've worked with the Environmental Finance Center at UNC Chapel Hill to provide guidance on interlocal agreements and the various utility structures that are available to communities across the state in an easy to read concise format. Because as Sharon indicated, maybe merger is the best solution for that long-term solution uh, for our smaller systems. This puts the information in front of the, the managers, in front of the boards, um, so that they can understand it and make the local decision that they feel is best for them. Um, but of course, more is needed. Um, we feel like uh, uh, we need a new grant program that can provide that comprehensive solution to get more communities to a long-term solution. Um, and that's why we've supported the idea of a viable utility grant program, like one that is in the water and wastewater public enterprise reform bills which provide grants to utilities to help consolidate with others, reset the utility, resulting in a financially viable system. The viable utility program would include consolidation studies, asset inventory and assessment, because Rose, as you mentioned in the beginning, a lot of our uh, water infrastructure is underground. And we don't necessarily know the condition of it. It'll, uh, pay for rate studies to understand what the rates are. And again, this is part of making a well-informed local decision. And then it provides more project funding than our existing programs can provide. Uh, this bill, or these bills actually, were recently reintroduced as Senate Bill 810 and House Bill 1087. And um, Representative McGrady, who's been with us today, co-chaired the study committee that first introduced this idea. That's important. Thank you. And Kim, I'm going to call on you one more time and put you on the spot on this one. Be sure your video is turned back on. And I'm going to ask you the big question, and uh, a big question, and that is, if we don't find a solution, what happens next, Kim? Uh, sorry about that. I had never turned my video off, so I'm not sure what happened. Um, well, you know, a lot of our communities are kind of in that downward spiral because of these water infrastructure issues. And, and I think Sharon articulated a lot of that really well. Um, and unless we can find them help, uh, that spiral will result in those really financial uh, difficulties where the LGC potentially has to step in. But of course, we're really focused on finding solutions, and I'm optimistic that we'll find a solution for most of these communities. Um, we're very appreciative of all the different organizations that are working on this. As Sharon mentioned, they work with so many. We obviously work with the Department of State Treasurer and all these other organizations around the state 
that provide the educational, the technical expertise. Um, but we do need something more because there is that infrastructure bill to pay for as well. So we're very appreciative of the support that the General Assembly has provided uh, to really put in the, the time um, and willingness to listen to these issues and understand these issues. And of course, introducing the legislation that we feel will be a solution for many of these rural communities. Thank you very much. Mayor Brown, is this a solution for Bethel? And, and you talked about some of what you're working on and can you tell us what that looks like on the ground? Oops, you're muted, I'm sorry. You are muted. Okay, I'm good, thank you. Sorry but about that. Bingo. Um, okay. Uh, Rose, yes, um, what Kim is saying, that is the solution. Um, pretty much what, and I can say for us, this, the regional merging uh, will be the best idea for us uh, because again, uh, with all the infrastructure that has to be, that has to take place and not being able to uh, provide, the, uh, having the funding uh, to make these changes and it will help with, uh, I'm looking at economic development. I think it will uh, bring some type of growth. I mean, we're not looking to boom, but I think it will, you know, we're here, uh, we're close to um, where the interstate is gonna, we're gonna have an interstate 87 and, and also, you know, just, um, knowing that we can have maybe not the, the huge uh, industries to come here, but it allow and it opens up for more housing um, to come. And, and, and so we'll be able to serve our, our citizens a lot better. And it will take a lot of the pressure off of the citizens here in the community. So I, I, it, it, it will work better. Because I, like I said, we cannot afford to keep as a small town keep assuming loans, we, we just can't make it that way. Um, and you're setting yourself up for a fall. Um, it may look good for that time being to say, okay, yeah, we'll go get a loan, but eventually in the long run, you're gonna be looking at Sharon and, and, and looking in her face and then she has to do her job. And, but we have to really think about it. And I really appreciate uh, Kim and uh, Sharon at opening up the opportunity that we can get educated because I'm still learning. I, I haven't learned everything. I'm still learning a lot with this, with this process. So we do need to reach out and grab everything that we can get in order to save our town and to protect our citizens. You're so right. Education is a big part of that. That's part of this good forum that the Rural Center is putting on. We're so grateful for that. In our last minutes here, we have two of the last prepared questions that are for the whole panel. And, I, and I, you've touched on one of them, which is education and making sure everyone's aware of this problem. What can people listening and watching this webinar today do to contribute to a solution? And I'll put this to all of you. Wants to go, Sharon? Um, I think one thing is um, for local boards and staff to keep an open mind about regionalization. Um, we often see just resistant to even the topic being broached. And, um, you know, regionalization isn't always the answer, but a lot of times some type of regionalization um, is very beneficial to all the parties involved. So, um, you know, and, and there are, there's lots of help as Kim mentioned on how to craft good interlocal agreements. Um, and then we all know you know, examples of, of regionalization that did not work. And I think we've learned from, from those uh, situations and can provide better guidance now than we could say 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but I think that would be my number one thing is just to keep an open mind. Anything else from Ken that you are, are forcing? I, I just agree with what Sharon say. Um, we need to have an open mind and when you're at the table, make sure you know what you're signing on to and put your ideas on the table and work together to make it happen. But I think it's overall, in my opinion, I think it would be the best way to go for a lot of our rural towns and small towns, communities. Yeah, Rose, I would agree with Sharon and Mayor Brown as well. Um, I think regionalization is um, an answer for many communities because it allows you to expand your customer base. Um, it 
is the ability to essentially share resources <clears throat> and those management resources, uh, the financial resources are so important uh, to making a system viable. And the other thing I would throw in is uh, for people just to get involved in their local water system and to learn more about it, how it operates, uh, and better understand the service that's provided that's so critical for your community. Um, and the more you understand that, the more you'll understand why a rate increase may be necessary, and uh, the more you can talk with your council members and mayors and so forth. That's perfect. It's something you take for granted. It's a great point. The last question we have for the, for the whole panel at this point, just to wrap up, how does the COVID-19 pandemic influence this challenge and the proposed solutions? I know you mentioned one, Mayor Brown did, with the utility um, disconnection executive order. Well, in my opinion, um, I'll, I'll kind of start out and just say that I think it really puts additional pressure on a, a system that in a, many of our communities is already fairly fragile. Um, and it's not just some of the things Mayor Brown mentioned about bill collection in the short term, but I think there's also some longer term economic issues that are gonna put further pressure on many of our rural systems. Yeah, I, I agree with what everything Kim said. Um, the short term issue with collections and, and not being able to, to enforce collections is certainly a, an issue that units are dealing with now in terms of revenue, but the longer term impact with the loss of some businesses um, may be more devastating than the short term lack of revenue. That's right. Yeah, I agree with what they say, Rose, pretty much. And sometimes when people get so behind, it, 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 they're not going to be able to catch up if this um, continues. That's right. It's a hard, it's a hard choice. Yeah. Uh, there were some pre submitted questions. Um, I'll just touch on those and um, one was um, wanting, and this is from Travail Harrell in Tarboro and Edgecombe County, need clarification on why a decision has not been made to release funds for Hurricane Matthew, Edgecombe County residents um, since 2019. That is um, who particular panel might be able to address that. Have you seen that question, Kim? Um, we don't currently administer um, those funds, so um, I'm not able to answer that question. It's through the Department of Commerce now, is that right? Uh, public safety, maybe. Yeah, I'm sorry. And the new office. And the next question that was submitted, what are some resources presently available to municipalities to help them address these issues? From Washington and Beaufort County. I think we well, from a... From a funding program standpoint, we obviously have um, a project funding to actually build the infrastructure, but I think some of our more important programs are we have an asset inventory and assessment grant um, that's available for uh, systems to go in, look at that underground infrastructure, know what you have, know what needs to be done, then you can really plan out your capital improvement plan and use that as a basis for rate studies and so forth. We also have a merger regionalization feasibility grant as well that allows you to explore those alternate utility structures that may provide a long-term solution. Um, I will say that most of our project funding is in the form of subsidized loans, which provide a tremendous financial benefit, but our loan programs are much bigger than our grant programs. Thank you very much. We're going to go now while we can to our legislators because we're very fortunate to have them and the legislature is in session today and the House is in session. And I know Representative McGrady has asked if he uh, want to use the form while he can be available. So I'm going to turn now to Representative McGrady for remarks. Thank you very much, Representative McGrady. Good morning. Uh, glad to be here. I've never presented bills on the floor while doing a, uh, a panel at the same time. Uh, but it's amazing what one can uh, try to get scheduled. Um, I guess I'd bring to your attention the fact that the, the legislature is about to move on uh, the viable utilities fund funding question. Uh, House Bill 1087 has been reworked uh, 
um, and is going to move through the process fairly quickly, I'm guessing. This is the bill that came out of a study committee that Senator Newton and I had um, relating back to the problem of in Eureka where um, a system was functionally bankrupt and about to close. Um, and we jumped in and dealt with that last October, uh, but there needs to be a longer term solution. Um, there are, we're well aware that uh, when you put into the mix, the, the finances for these, the utilities run by local governments, um, frankly, you've got mo local governments, both municipalities and actually some counties um, that are probably functionally bankrupt. Um, and they're caught between a rock and a hard place. The DEQ is telling them to make capital improvements to improve and, and protect water quality. And they don't have the ability to raise the rates. They don't have the bunny ability to, to generate other funds. And so this is an effort. It, uh, I believe the allocation is about $9 million. And that is a huge lift if you think about it at a point in time when we are uh, have a several billion dollar deficit um, we are re um, using monies from other places to put here so that municipalities local governments will have the ability to uh, to uh, um, access emergency funds so I, I see that as huge and my other hat is as a budget chair, um, I've already referenced the budget problem, um, uh, which is going to be dealt with in a piecemeal fashion. But um, I will tell I can only report that it's as of now, um, there uh, are no cuts of which I'm aware to anything affecting water infrastructure. Um, and I can't say that about a lot of other things. And so those two things should send a signal to you that um, I think uh, leadership and the members in the General Assembly get it. They realize how important this is, uh, that even in a awful financial year, um, they're not trying to pull back from providing help uh, to local governments to deal with these utility sets of issues, particularly the the, the the sewer system issue. Thank you very much, Representative McGrady. It's your leadership that has helped um, turn the legislature and, and helped educate um, other leaders in the legislative um, building about the needs that are out there. We're very grateful, very appreciative, and very supportive of that bill. Thank you very much. Um, now, Senator Don Davis is with us as well, um, also a leader in, in small um, government, knowledge, knowledgeable of small government, municipalities, and rural parts of the state, and the needs. And Senator Davis, if you are able to join us now, and um, we can be delighted to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Rose. I want to uh, first start by saying, um, Representative McGrady, we uh, greatly appreciate um, all your work, you know, on these um, issues and leadership um, broadly in the General Assembly. Um, been a great champion on a lot of these issues that matter most to our state. Um, I, I want to um, share with everyone and just kind of paint the, the picture in terms of my background. <clears throat> and where I think some of the challenges lie here. Um, as a former mayor, um, I, I must admit that one of the greatest priorities I believe that exists there often um, is your utilities, whether it's water, sewer, some communities, electric, um, but these can be some of the greatest needs, but the unfortunate reality, um, you know, when we, have elections and you start getting knee deep into water and wastewater issues, um, you're losing constituents. However, this is one thing that every constituent will understand. And that's how high their rates are. They're gonna understand when they get that bill and they start looking at it, um, how much we're asking them to pay. Um, so I, I believe some of this, um, becomes a real challenge, especially when we're talking rural communities, 
smaller populations, um, aging populations. Um, as mayor in Snow Hill at the time, this was, uh, we got hit by the Great Recession, and we had one business alone that really just totally, um, it, because it relied heavily on the utility, utility funds, um, allowed us uh, or made us quickly to have to look at um, our rate structure. You know, so there's many outstanding factors um, that's taking place. And, and oddly, um, you know, as the mayor, I'm just being candid. A lot of times I will point the finger, the finger at Raleigh on top of all these challenges. We had to deal with the aquifer, um, just so many issues taking place. Um, and interestingly, um, I must admit, um, I've seen Sharon and, and great to work with her over the years. You know, but um, as a mayor, I did get one of those letters. Um, I saw the, the number of governments represented here today. Um, so I, I really do understand the challenges and, and it's good to have Mayor Brown and hear from her um, because there's a real partnership that is taking place now um, with the town of Belt, of which I represent. Um, and, and Kim, I do thank you and DQ for all that you're doing um, to continue to foster this type of um, relationship and partnership. Um, I would I would say this, um, as Representative McGrady shared earlier, um, with redistricting at one point, now I have represented nearly 15% of the high-risk municipalities in terms of those in a county that I represented. Um, oddly, when you look at just uh, you know, those counties, that on the um, unit assistance list, I, I mean, nearly 70% the last time I saw were rural counties often in, in rural Eastern North Carolina. Um, so I'm raising these concerns. This is something that is near and dear to me. And I believe we must continue to seek strate strategic partnerships between the state and our communities looking for sustainability models we must continue to make meaningful invest, investments in education and training employees. Um, we, and I want to be clear on this call um, that I support Senate Bill 810 or, the, or a House version that brings forth the vi viability utility reserve um, and a grant program. Um, I am currently monitoring um, now the updated Executive Order 142. I strongly believe that no community should be penalized or even placed on a unit um, assistance list exclusively because of financial woes associated with an executive order um, and if there are still collection issues at hand. And I feel very strongly about that. Um, I also would add um, to the list that Representative McGrady put out there, I'm a bill that we are looking to possibly provide some sort of assistance with um, residents in terms of utilities, because um, this pandemic, it's really hitting not only the businesses, but um, our residents and our economy very hard. And I'm, I'm gonna wind down here uh, for time's sake, um, but we have to continue um, providing assistance um, to our municipalities. I know there's been funds that's gone um, and, and, and a, more of those CARES dollars we've sent to counties. I know there's concerns there, but where I'm going to head is I believe in the midst of all of this that's taking place, and now even more so with COVID-19, there are broader economic conversations that must take place. Some of this is tied to, and, and I remember this, been in Eastern North Carolina, you talk to a lot of uh, young people, they graduate and they can't wait to leave com the communities. And when rural communities financially struggle, this is a part of this struggle, uh, which becomes re uh, reflective of, um, I think, a broader um, economic challenge that exists um, due to often limited uh, resources and our ability to uh, bring in more resources into these the rural areas, I believe, becomes key to even 
um, dealing with this issues and many, many others, even when we talk about education and beyond. Thank you. Senator Davis, thank you very, very much. Very grateful. And thank you, Patrick and Brandy, very much. And all panel. All right, so we will now jump into our, our Q&A. Um, and I noticed that we have a number of questions that have been posted uh, via the live Q&A. So I will jump right in and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And with the questions that we don't get to, uh, we'll try to work with you panelists thereafter and, and post those to our website. So uh, Senator Davis, I imagine this is a question that would be posed to you and Representative McGrady if you're still on and can hear me um, for the two of you to respond to. But that since the 2019 State Water Infrastructure Authority report notes that 50% of state appropriated grant funds were pre allocations, right, essentially earmarks by the General Assembly. Now, given the significant water finance needs in the state, can you speak to why so much of that funding is done this way? I guess I'd jump into that one since I'm an appropriation share. I oppose those earmarks. Um, but those earmarks uh, get put in by um, well-positioned uh, legislators, uh, both in the Senate and the House. And uh, um, I've kicked them all the way to the two corner offices uh, last year and didn't get what I wanted. Um, I think uh, that's not the way to allocate monies. That's an old school way of allocating it, but it doesn't always mean you put the monies in the right place. And uh, I apologize for it, but I and I agree with this sentiment expressed in the question. And, and I would simply, you know, add, you know, to that. Um, I do believe, however, we need to continue to focus on what I would almost categorize as more of an it's urgent in emergency situations because they are real and there are communities out there um, right now that are just stuck trying to figure, the, figure these questions and these issues out. And that's what I do believe that we're having more constructive conversations around. Thank you, thank you both for that. Um, there are a number of questions centered around uh, potential or current consolidation or merger of systems across the state. Um, so can someone on the panel, if not all of you probably can speak to this, but how many systems are we talking about that have been consolidated or merged in recent history? I don't know how many have merged um, over the last 20 years. I know a lot more are looking at it right now. Um, obviously, we're working with the, the town of Bethel um, on their merger. And um, there are several people uh, or systems who have reached out to us saying they need to look at this. Um, and they need to find some sort of alternative. Um, you know, we, when we first proposed the idea of our merger regionalization feasibility grants, we thought one or two per year would apply for that, but we, we typically get around 10 uh, applications a year, and that's not the whole universe. A lot of other folks are looking at this and recognizing they've got to be put in a position where they can better share resources because those resources are so limited. Thank you. Any additions to that? Um, well, I, I just want to say that uh, to just to put out there that we did reach out to a municipality that did have already, um, uh, they have already merged, they did do with Wake County. And so the mayor uh, drove down to speak with the manager and I about some of the, the, uh, the, the good and the bad of them merging, but it was in overall, it was the right thing to do. But it's just a lot of work and a lot of process that has to go through to make sure that you are uh, putting the right things in place for your citizens. And so that was a big help to reach out to someone that has already done, uh, been through the process. Thank you, thank you all for that. Uh, the next question uh, centered around, um, what are some of the good examples of towns or counties who are addressing deteriorating water and wastewater infrastructure systems in a good way? And what lessons can be shared from those counties who are able to do it the right way? We need to, we need to hear from the great mayor of Bethel on this one. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad of the work that um, my mayor and Kim, you know, 
I, and I, and Kim, I remember being in the committee and, and I think we may had a, had a conversation somewhere around this last year, just talking about the importance of really uh, providing a model. But I really think we, rat, we have a great panelist that can speak on this. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know about all, but again, education is, is, is the key and speaking with, and, and again, going and talking to with Kim and all, like I said, I'm still learning because this is really new to me as well, but anyone that you can reach out to, um, it, always be in the learning mode because um, you need to make sure that you're putting the things that you're doing. You want to make sure that you're doing it right. Um, I did hear of some other municipalities that are in the situations that we are in, but they are very reluctant about the merging and they are worried about uh, control, but you got to understand the process of it and some is they're just not for it. Um, but I think getting going to the table, sitting to the table, asking the right questions, um, I think um, I just think it's, it's for the betterment of your community. And real quick, I'll chime in and say, I think Mayor Brown um, had a great example of, of going and asking somebody who had already gone through that. And in our urban areas, almost all those utilities have gone through some sort of consolidation because it's just a better business model for them. And they've gone through that, utilized those resources. Most of them are very willing to help. And of course, the Environmental Finance Center at UNC and the, the whole School of Government is a great resource as well. Thank you for that. Um, I have one additional question, probably two more we're going to try to get in the next minute or so. Um, but the other question is, again, related to merging. And the question is, is there a potential benefit to merge or consolidate management of systems versus or opposed to physical merger? Yeah, I would chime in on that and say, I think that's the absolute key um, with mergers is that pooling of management resources. Um, so instead of having three or four managers and three or four billing systems, it's all consolidated. It's one system. You have a better opportunity to retain operators and the operation staff give them the ability to be promoted within um, and different things like that. And you know, there are private examples of that taking place. Um, you look at the private utilities across the state, they have tens of thousands of customers, but they're not all in one or two systems. They're spread out across the state, but they have centralized management. Great. Thank you. And one last question I'm going to try to squeeze in before we close out and then I give some final remarks um, is around what can people do if they want to get involved in their local water system? Where do you start? Who do you talk to? Well, I think the best thing they can do is talk to their elected officials. <laughs> That's um, what I was getting ready to say. <laughs> I think uh, uh, as, as mayor and, and also as, you know, I, I always uh, tell my citizens, uh, always, if there's any questions, anything that you do not understand, please come see me or, you know, and better still talk to the manager. But we work, I will say that the manager and I work well, very well together. Uh, we have each other's backs. Um, we, we try to make sure that we are educated. We try to find all the resources. Um, I don't mind reaching out to people asking questions uh, because the questions come to us. And so you need to be prepared, but just get in, just, you got to want to not hesitate to come and ask questions. Just at, when you upset about your water bill or whatever, when you get it, you don't mind running to us then to jump on our case about that. So <laughs> understand why the things are put in place and why we have to do what we have to do. That, that, that's the best way I can put it. Thank you all very much. And we've definitely reached our time. And I'll take just a second uh, to review a couple of reminders for folks who are listening in. Um, shortly after today's session, you'll receive a thank you email um, asking you to complete a survey. I promise it'll only take a moment of your time. It's also an opportunity for you to win a Bluetooth speaker. So if you are all interested in having a Bluetooth speaker, this is your way of getting one today. We're also excited to announce we're going to have a bonus session on topic we just talked about, which is engaging your elected officials. Um, we'll send details out to folks who are on this call and folks who have attended our five-part series, but stay tuned for the details of that. In addition to that, reminding folks that 2020 is the year of the census. 
We're talking about rural communities. Uh, the dollars that are allocated per census data are really vitally important to rural communities. So if you haven't completed your census, spend the five to seven minutes right now to get it done. Uh, in addition to that, we of course want to wholeheartedly thank each and every one of you as our panelists, our moderator, our state legislators for joining us today. We very much appreciate your time, your capacity, and your expertise on this issue. So thank you all very much. Thank you to all of you, our attendees. Thank you to our sponsors for today's session. Be well, stay well, everyone, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.